Hi, uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to another one of our Grand Rounds, uh, hosted at the Heart Institute uh, in uh, Ottawa, and uh, but really broadcast across the uh, uh, divisions uh, across the country in Canada. I'd like to welcome uh, everybody to our first session for 2021, and uh, where we say goodbye to 2020, and uh, and uh, look forward certainly to 2021. Uh, with uh, lots of hope and anticipation. And uh, so uh, for our, this uh, for this session on the technical side, uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, as the uh, our uh, honored guest speaker uh, delivered lecture, uh, please feel free to pose your questions uh, in the Q&A uh, box under uh, your screen. Uh, if you have any technical challenges, please use the chat. Uh, to uh, uh, to uh, discuss uh, with uh, Kelsey, who will help you uh, to join the session if you have uh, any uh, difficulties. And uh, we particularly welcome our guests who are able to join us across Canada uh, for this uh, special uh, Grand Rounds. And uh, we are most privileged today to have an expert uh, who is a consummate leader in uh, cardiovascular outcomes research and precision medicine, but he's uh, also a leading thinker of some of the practical methodology and tools uh, for patient-centered uh, outcomes assessment and uh, quantification of uh, uh, health care quality. Dr. John Spertus is the Lower Missouri Endowed Chair and uh, Tenure Professor of Medicine at the University of Missouri in Kansas City and also Director of Outcomes Research at Mid-America Heart Institute and uh, he's also practicing cardiologist there. And Dr. Spertus uh, is a graduate of UCSF and completed his uh, cardiology and uh, health research, uh, health system research uh, training at the University of Washington. Many of us uh, are most familiar and in fact uses uh, the tools that which are classic really today in cardiology uh, by Dr. Spertus such as Seattle and Joanna Questionnaire and the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. And uh, these are really tools uh, which uh, help us to uh, evaluate uh, the patient's symptoms, functional capacity, and quality of life uh, for uh, both coronary artery disease as well as heart failure, uh, respectively. And each of these tools have been translated to over 95 languages around the world and used this uh, routinely today, whether for clinical trials, uh, for uh, health uh, care quality assessment and for improving the care of our patients. And they have been also adopted by regulatory agencies such as the FDA and EMA as approved endpoints uh, for new therapy uh, evaluation. Dr. Spertus has uh, held continuous uh, NIH funding over the last two decades. And of course, many of us know that just in the last year in 2020, uh, he has had two first authored papers in New England Journal on the health status outcomes of major clinical trials such as ischemia and ischemia CKD uh, sponsored by uh, NIH. And he further aims to uh, use uh, the best individualized health care uh, tools and uh, to achieve the lowest possible risk while also minimizing costs, achieving the best outcomes for our patients and the goals of uh, precision medicine very much championed by uh, our research group as well. And for his outstanding achievement, he's uh, received many recognitions awards. Uh, in addition to American Society of Clinical Investigation, he has received three separate awards from the American Heart Association, and that include uh, the Distinguished Achievement Award from the Council of Quality Care Outcomes, and also the AHA Distinguished Scientist Award, and also AHA's Lifetime Achievement Award. So we truly look forward to Dr. Spurgeon's talk today as the opening plenary for our 2021 series. And it's entitled Overview of Patient Report Outcomes Using the Patient's Voice in Clinical Trials, Quality Assessment, and Clinical Care. Thank you very much. Well, thank you uh, so very much, Peter. I, I, you know, I'm really sorry that my mom couldn't be here to, to listen to this because that was the nicest introduction and, and she would just be so proud but I really uh, I, I appreciate you uh, inviting me to present your your first of 2021 I'm glad I didn't get lumped into 2020 last year so um, thank you very very much 
Um, I, I was asked by uh, Dr. Lou to talk about uh, patient part outcomes, particularly in, in terms of heart failure. And we recently published uh, a state-of-the-art state review on um, interpreting the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire in November and Jack. And uh, a lot of this is sort of the background and context for understanding that article. And uh, before I start, I would say that uh, you know, these are my disclosures. And the most important is that, you know, I, I've written and, and, and copyrighted uh, a number of different uh, quality of life questionnaires for coronary disease, heart failure, peripheral artery disease. And, and so you should know that as I uh, uh, talk today. So, you know, today what I was hoping to accomplish was first to just basically state the obvious. Why are patient reported outcomes important in heart failure? Um, and then really give you a little bit of background on the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire, the KCCQ, which is a disease-specific PRO for heart failure. And then the bulk of the lecture is sort of thinking about it in the context of clinical trials. How do we use the KCCQ to enroll the right patients to conduct and interpret the results and how to translate the data into practice? And then just end with how I see it being able to be used in clinical practice and quality of care assessment, which is sort of the next phase of trying to get the patient's voice into the way we help provide care for patients. So, you know, we spend a lot of time in heart failure because it's such a morbid disease, really thinking about mortality alone or mortality and hospitalization as the key outcomes. And, you know, this was a classic, I mean, it's over 20 years old now, patient level uh, meta-analysis of the uh, benefits of ACE inhibitors. One of the key foundations of the way that we care for patients with heart failure. And, and what it showed when you look at all the trials and you look out to five years, that the rate of dying in the placebo group of the DASH line was uh, um, much greater than that of the uh, ACE inhibitor treated group, and the p-value was highly statistically significant. The issue that I would say is if you look at, at one year and you look at the y-axis here, you're talking about a mortality rate that is really at about you know, 10 to 12 percent, right? And the question is, while it is the statistically significantly better on ACE inhibitors, how did the other 90% of the patients in the trial do it one year? You know, were they doing really well? Did they have good symptom control or were they doing really poorly? And we don't know because these early trials didn't collect the kind of data that could let us know how the entire population fared. And so, you know, when we think about treating patients, clearly we want to prevent further progression of the disease. Much of our research, much of our effort looks to understand the neurobiohormonal uh, axes that lead to progression of heart failure that manifests itself as fatal arrhythmias, as emissions, and as death. And so we clearly want to make patients live longer. But the other thing, and the thing that our patients want to do is to feel better. They want to have their symptoms, their function, and their quality of life to improve, and many patients would actually trade a substantial amount of the duration of their survival if their remaining survival could be better. And so, you know, for us as trialists, as scientists, we need to measure both outcomes well. And it is in this context that we develop the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. And the underlying concept around the KCCQ is that there is a disease process. You know, there's you know, systolic or diastolic dysfunction and myocardial injury. There's uh, activation of the renal angiotensin system. Uh, there's injury from ischemia or other events. And this leads to lots of uh, forward and back here, backward failure from, from, from the heart and, and is what we try and think about understanding what is going on when we start to recommend treatments and, and approaches to our patients. However, you know, those underlying processes are occult to patients. They don't know, no patient knows what their EF is. They know how their EF impacts their symptoms of fatigue, dyspnea, lower extremity edema, 
how it limits their physical, emotional, or social activity. And their quality of life, you know, this is sort of a modification of the Wilson Cleary model, but it basically is the idea that um, given my symptoms and my function and how I would expect to be doing, the greater that discrepancy, the worse my quality of life. So if you imagine two patients who both had shortness of breath climbing a flight of stairs and um, uh, had shortness of breath, you know, once or twice a week, but not every day. And one patient was a 42 year old construction worker. She might be very upset and have a very poor quality of life because her 42 year old colleagues do not have limitations climbing a flight of stairs. They do not have shortness of breath a couple times a week. And you know, she's having difficulty now conducting her job as a construction worker. Whereas if the same patient with the same symptoms and the same functional limitations were an 82 year old, maybe they don't mind just waiting for the elevator. You know, For their quality of life, it might be spectacular even though they have these symptoms and functional limitations because they're doing so much better than their colleagues. And so the idea that these, all of these different manifestations of the disease as they impact patients can be measured is the underlying principle behind the KCCQ. And importantly, it captures or tries to capture the, the uh, whole range of health status, the way in which the disease affects patients from the patient's perspective as opposed to the underlying disease process that we traditionally focus on as clinicians and scientists. And so the KCCQ was designed specifically to capture each of those areas. There's a 23 out of 12 item version. Uh, the 12 item was, uh, came up around about a decade and a half later after we sort of figured out what the most important items were. And it asks those things that an experienced clinician would ask in a routine clinical visit. How limited are you in doing certain physical activities because of your heart failure? How often are you having it? How bad is it? How has it changed over time? Is it interfering with your ability to work or to engage in social activities? Self-efficacy is a, a domain in the 23, but not the 12 item version that, that asks about, do you know what to do to prevent your heart failure from getting worse? And then how is it impacting your quality of life? You know, it's been translated over a hundred translations and, uh, and it's been really used you know, all over the world because we have extensive data on its validity, its reliability, its responsiveness. I won't go into that much except that part of the discussion will really get into how to interpret the KCCQ. And then you know, it's been ultimately qualified by the FDA as a clinical outcome assessment. And this is very, very important because the FDA has been criticized a lot for being a barrier to the development of new therapies because the belief was that you had to prove that a therapy made patients live longer, prevented hospitalizations. And that has not been the FDA standpoint. They have sort of felt you have to make patients either live longer or feel better. And so last year they came out with, or two years ago now, they came out with um, sort of a clarification of their guidance, which is that they just issued the statement to make it clear that effect on symptoms or physical function without a favorable effect on survival or hospitalization could still be a basis for approving drugs. And so this is a very important step. It means that therapies can be introduced and labels can be offered for something that improves the health status of the patient. Now, how are you gonna measure the health status? That is a very challenging thing. And, and I could spend forever talking about the ordeal, but suffice it to say, to get the FDA uh, drug side, CEDAR, to uh, accept the KCCQ as a clinical outcome assessment has taken five years and 5,000 pages of data and documentation trying to do it. But ultimately, in 2017, the, the device side uh, through its MDDT qualified the KCCQ for um, uh, a clinical outcome assessment. And just last year, we finally were able to get qualification from the drug side, CEDAR. And so this is, a, I think, a really important step forward. And you know, there's a lot of reasons why they did it, but part of why it was approved 
was that the different scales of the KCCQ capture these domains of the way heart failure manifests itself to patients in very specific ways. We have symptom scales that get specifically at the symptoms, physical and social function scales for functional limitation and a quality of life scale. There are summary scales. Uh, the clinical summary scale uh, is trying to replicate the New York Heart Association classification by uh, integrating symptoms and physical function. And the overall summary scale tries to capture the totality of patient's health status. Um, understanding these are important because different trials, different studies often present different scales. And to me, this is beginning to become a real impediment to understanding the benefits of th treatments on a common scale. They all use the KCCQ, but they all analyze it differently and they emphasize different scales, some for regulatory reasons, some for random reasons. Uh, and yet, you know, I think we need to start creating a more standard way of reporting the impact of treatment on patients. Um, you know, I've talked about the KCCQ like it's this magical thing. You know, there's something weird. I, I, I want to just make it clear that what a simplistic concept this is and the best contributions in science often are the simplest, right? So, so this is the 12 item KCCQ. And essentially what it you know, does is it's just asking very straightforward questions the same way every time to every patient. It asks how much is your heart failure limited your ability to shower, bathe, a very low sort of two met activity, walking a block on level ground, sort of a four to six met level activity, or hurry your jogging to catch a bus, sort of a six to eight met activity. And people just say they're extremely to not at all limited. You know, it asks about how often patients are having symptoms of lower extremity edema when they get up. Fatigue, you know, how many times a day or how many times a week do you have fatigue? shortness of breath, uh, orthopnea, how is it impacting your quality of life? And how is it impacting your social interactions and participating in hobbies or recreational activities, working or doing household activities or visiting friends and family outside the house? I mean, I would love to present, pretend this is the most complex, sophisticated assay in the world, but it isn't. It's a very straightforward, way of asking and scoring the responses every patient every day. And that's its, its real sort of beauty. So how can we start to use these in clinical trials? And I, I'm gonna, in, in one swell, fell swoop, talk about sort of patient selection, conduct and analysis and, and, and translation. And when we do a clinical trial, basically we need to get patients that meet a certain criteria because we want the results of the trial to be applicable for a certain phenotype of heart failure. We then conduct the trial and we have to analyze and render those data understandable so that we can translate the results of that clinical trial into clinical practice. And so I'm gonna tackle each of these in three different sections. The first is using PROs to select patients for trial eligibility. You know, essentially every heart failure trial uses the New York heart to identify patients. The problem is that the New York heart is assigned by providers, not patients. And this, there is known to be great variability in the way the exact same patient showing up to two different providers, whether they would be called NYJ one, two, three, or four. In fact, the cap of the agreement between different providers of the exact same patient is only 54%. And yet, if you look at the agreement of the KCCQ in stable patients, so patients who you know, have not changed and you give the KCCQ a month apart, the uh, test retest reliability, the intraclass correlation coefficient is 0.92 or 92%. You know, it's far more reproducible because it's, He's asking the exact same question exactly the same way. And, you know, if you want to identify a homogenous group of patients to expose to a clinical trial, why wouldn't you use patient report on outcome measures? It could preclude gaming. And as many people know, there was a lot of concern in Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus in the 
uh, um, spironolactone trials that they were not really enrolling patients that had, you know, sick heart failure or even heart failure at all, you know, and, and if you're working in an international trial and there's an incentive, you, the, the enroll, enrolling physicians or sites get paid a lot of money to enroll a patient, they're going to call somebody who might be class one, class two, if that's what's required to get into the trial. And it also ensures the patients have the opportunity to benefit. This is a study we did to sort of define the interoperability. So it's 500 patients, uh, one site in Canada, 13 in the US. And we basically had the patient and the uh, fill out the New York, uh, the KCCQ, the doctor complete a New York card. And this is the probability of each New York heart class by KCCQ score. And so what is impressive about this study is if a patient has a KCCQ score of 50, right? So right in the middle, depending on what doctor they saw, they have a 17% chance of being called class one, a 60% chance of being called class two, a 21% chance of being called class three, and a 2% chance of being called class four. This is the, the same patient with the exact same KCCQ score. This variability means to me that the New York Heart is not a very good way of classifying this patient, especially if every patient's going to look different, you know, you know different, the same patients can look different on what doctor they happen to see. And as a trialist, let's just say you want to enroll class two patients. Your class two patients could have in this study KCCQ scores from zero to 100. How could you show an improvement in your class two patients who have scores of 95 to 100? They can't get better. So you're undermining your ability to detect a treatment benefit by relying on the New York heart that could enroll very asymptomatic patients. In fact, um, on the Captain McCarble, the, the galactic trial was just reported uh, uh, at the AHA. And if you look at, they were all supposed to be class two, three. And if you look at the patients that were enrolled, which was 80% of the patients were enrolled as outpatients, they were supposed to be class two, class three, but the upper uh, quartile is at nine, a score of 92. So 25% of the patients in Oma Captain McCarble uh, in Galactic were in this circle. How could they have gotten better from a new inotrope, right? So it's a big issue. And we, uh, one of my fellows recently reported looking across a number of clinical trials, not only the one I just described in detail in A, but uh, also in the uh, HF action and the top cat studies. And you're seeing a very high proportion of scores greater than 80, really underscoring that I think there are better ways to select patients for clinical trials than the New York heart. Once you have a trial uh, and you decide to enroll the patients and you go to the effort to collect the KCCQ, how you interpret those results is a very, very important issue. So this was a landmark trial, right? In 2014, six years ago, uh, the Paradigm study came out and it was a major new era of heart failure medicines. And when you look at the results, the primary and secondary outcomes, what do you see is that in, uh, in salcubitrol valsartan, which at that time was called LCZ696, there was a three-point decrement in the KCCQ clinical sum summary score compared with a 4.6 decrement. It was a, a mean difference of 1.64 points and uh, the p-value was 0 0.001. Um, and the key question is, you know, is that an important difference? And, you know, this comes from a very, uh, I think, challenging aspect of understanding and analyzing patient report outcomes. Because when we use PROs, some patients will get a lot better, some won't change, and some will get a lot worse. And so when we do a clinical trial like Paradigm, we have a potpourri of patients who are green, yellow, and red. 
And yet we're reporting the mean difference across the entire groups. And to me, this is very difficult to interpret because as you look at this graphic, you don't actually see any patient who was actually treated who has a green head, yellow body, or red legs, right? So, you know, how are we supposed to interpret mean differences? These are sort of the mean differences, either for the overall summary score or the clinical summary score across a range of different, you know, studies. And what you're seeing are mean differences that are, are pretty small, you know, a point and a half to, you know, four points, maybe as high as almost five. And, you know, that's not helping us really figure out what is uh, the benefit of a therapy in terms of patient's health status. What we need to be doing is looking at the distribution of change. What proportion of patients were green? What proportion of patients were red? So we can understand, you know, who's better and who's worse. And how do you define who's better or who's worse? I mean, that's an important challenge. And so we conducted a specific study. This was, you know, 18 years ago, 20 years ago, to just figure out what does an important difference in score mean? And so we took 500 patients across uh, 13 North American cities, and we looked at the sort of, we knew that patients, if you just follow them over time, some will get worse, some will get better. And we wanted to exploit that random variation. So we gave uh, an assessment at one point in time in clinic. We followed up one to two months later. We gave them the Casey's Q, the New York Heart, six minute walk, you know, a bunch of other things, BNP levels, et cetera. And we asked both the physicians and the patient whether the patient changed or not. And these are the mean differences in KCCQ scores by whether the physician said the patient got a whole lot worse, moderately worse, a little worse, but clinically important, no real clinically important change, a little but clinically important uh, benefit, a moderate or very large benefit. And what's impressive about these data is the proportionality and the symmetry. And it's from these data that we now feel that a population group difference of five, 10, or 20 points is clinically important. And this has been the way that we have recommended trying to understand, you know, that a five point or greater difference is clinically important, but small. A moderate to large difference is 10 to 20, and a large to very large difference is greater than 20 points. And, you know, we have been able to amplify this by looking at the patient level correlation of 5, 10, and 20 point changes with distance on the six minute walk or V.02 as seen in HF action, or in at least half a dozen different trials looking at mortality and hospitalization or mortality alone. So that, you know, a change of five points for a patient alters their odds ratio of dying or dying and being hospitalized by about 10%. And that's a very big difference in my mind. So, you know, when you can figure out what proportion of patients get better or get worse, you can start to do responders analysis. You can look at the proportion of patients who get benefit, who improve by five or more points, by 10 or more points, by 20 or more points if it's a big intervention. And you can then subtract the proportions with a clinically important change between the two arms and convert it to number needed to treat by uh, dividing 100 by that difference in the rates. And so this is an example of uh, a very small Dapagliclozin study to define HF. And what they found to define, like they found in DAPA, is that at 12 weeks, there was a 3.7 point difference in the overall summary score and a 4.6 point difference in the clinical summary score that were clinically statistically significant. But both of those are less than the five point mean difference we just talked about. But this is the mean difference, not the proportion of patients. This is looking at the distribution of patients who got worse on the far left, who didn't change, who had small to moderate, moderate to large, or very large improvements. And that difference, most of the action is really in the very large improvement group. 
And what you're seeing is about a 10% absolute difference between the groups that got a whole lot better, meaning that you have a number needed to treat of about 10 for one patient to feel a whole lot better on dapagliflozin than not. And to me, that's a very low NNT and very important to be able to communicate to patients and to underscore to colleagues what the potential advantage would be of using DAP in, in these patients. Um, finally, you know, when we do our clinical trials, how do we start to move those results into clinical practice? And to me, we have done a terrible job. As trialists, we feel that as soon as we published our results in the New England Journal or JAMA or Lancet or whatever, and we presented it at the AHA or the ACC or ESC, we're done, right? Let's go on to the next trial. To me, that's very frustrating because frankly, the benefit is not in doing the trial, but in getting the results applied to the patients who benefit. And, and that's a very challenging thing. And I wanna take the example of CRT and heart failure. So. In heart failure, um, you know, we, we have this great therapy to resynchronize the ventricles, and it's supposed to be implemented through a dialogue and exchange between patients and their providers. And so the doctor explains to the patient, you have bad heart failure, your ventricle is not sort of coordinated the way it beats, and, you know, we have this new treatment that we can offer you, this CRT device. And the patient is then supposed to say, well, this is what's important to me, doctor. And together, they're supposed to decide whether or not to go forward with the CRT. Now, patients care an awful lot about their symptoms, function, and quality of life. And frankly, doctors have no idea how to share with patients how they themselves are likely to feel if the patient gets or doesn't get a CRT. And the reason doctors can't tell is these are the five uh, Medtronic randomized control trials comparing optimal medical therapy to CRT. They use the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaire, so uh, a, a lower scores is better, and so a more negative score is better. And when you average it out across all five trials, there's a 3.6 point difference favoring uh, CRT on the Minnesota Living with Heart Failure questionnaire. Now, the Minnesota has not gone through sort of the rigor that I described for the KCCQ, but we have mapped the, what does a five point change on the KCCQ mean in terms of the Minnesota? And it's about a 6.7 point difference. So a 3.6 point difference is about half of a clinical important difference. But that's again, on average, right? So that's very difficult to do. So what we did is we said, okay, let's take these five trials because we're underusing CRTs and let's build a precision medicine model to predict how an individual patient is likely to benefit from CRT therapy. And, and so this is the model. It doesn't matter, you know, the, the details of the model. This is a complicated model, but What's remarkably simple about the model is all you need to predict a patient level benefit in terms of quality of life is their age, the width of their QRS, and their baseline QL. With that, those three things, you plug it into a, an app or a computer and you can generate something that can estimate for a given patient what is their expected likelihood of doing well with or without CRT. And so we said, well, let's build a tool that was personalized will take the mortality benefit for CRT from uh, a patient level analysis of these five trials led by John Cleland. We'll take the quality of life benefit from the model I just described. And then we'll use the NCVR, a national cardiovascular da data registry to predict complications. So patients could get something that looked like this, where there's a shared decision-making tool that starts off with a very simple description about what is a CRT. Then you could say, what are the risks from the NCVR model? So you would use this patient's age, their ejection fraction, their history of heart failure to estimate, in this case, a 4% risk of any procedural complication. From the Cleveland model, you would show what's the likelihood of being alive in a year with or without CRT. And it, here favors by a little bit CRT, but, 
but not by a huge amount. And then you would say from the NASF model, what's the likelihood that the patient is gonna feel a whole lot better at three or 12 months? And here you're seeing a difference of 30 versus, you know, 47%. I mean, that's almost, you know, a 17 point percent difference. I mean, almost a one in five, one in six chance of feeling a whole lot better in three months if they get a CRT or not. There is about a 10% chance of, of being less likely to feel a whole lot worse. The ability to share with patients what the treatment is, what the risks are, what the sur survival and the quality of life benefit are is I think the foundation of shared decision-making along with information about you know, what that they're gonna set off the medical detector at the airport, things like that. To me, this is how we start to translate the results of clinical trials. You know, that those five clinical trials and another half dozen beyond them clearly show the benefit of CRT. And yet, you know, over a third to a half of patients eligible for CRT don't get it in America. Using tools like this to translate the results of clinical trial, I think is the final phase of using PROs in clinical trials. But what about in clinical practice, you know, and what about in quality assessment? You know, to me, what are the PROs? Well, what are they really doing? They're about hearing the patient's voice. It's about coming up with a way to systematically understand how our patients are doing. And that's what we need to do as clinicians taking care of our patients. You know, I'm um, old enough to remember rounding at the VA and you know, ECHO was certainly around, but it was not like it is today. And so we would round as medical students and there were these uh, very complicated patients with heart failure in the um, uh, San Francisco VA. And they would have systolic and diastolic murmurs and God knows everything was going on. And, you know, who knew sort of what was actually happening to the heart, right? I mean, the the attending would come by, they feel the carotid upstroke, they listen, they talk about the systolic murmur, the diastolic murmur, the Austin Flint, you know, the repercussions, they would percuss the heart out, they would palpate the PMI. And, you know, they would sort of tell all of us medical students what the physiology and anatomy of the heart was. And this led to limitations in accuracy and reproducibility of understanding the pathophysiology of the heart. And then we got echoes. And all of a sudden now we have a very standard reproducible way of understanding valvular and ventricular physiology. The gold standard for symptoms and, and its impact of patients' function quality of life is the history taking. Some doctors do a great job taking history, some do not. It leads to the same kind of limitations in accuracy and reproducibility and I would argue its evolution is starting to use PROs in routine clinical care. And I'd like to propose a very strong motivation nowadays to start to think about systematically using PROs in clinical care. And it has to do with the explosion of new therapies available for heart failure. So, you know, we have all these new treatments and largely they have fairly similar relative risk reductions in death and hospitalization. So how do you decide if you're gonna use an SGLT2 or you're gonna use Versiguat or you're gonna use uh, uh, you know, Omicaptive if it ever gets approved or if you're gonna use um, you know, Entresto, you know, you, why not look at it as the impact on quality of life? So you could essentially test try a new therapy with a patient and say, you know, Mrs. Jones, you know, we've been following you for a while. You currently have a KCCQ score of 60. You know, hasn't gotten a lot better over a few months. We have these new therapies. Let's try one and see if it makes you feel better. And so we give you the KCCQ before and after treatment. And if you get better, our treatment will continue. If not, we'll then try a different, you know, therapy. And the advantage is that the patient now knows why they're being treated. Oh, 
my doctors prescribing this medicine to see if my symptoms and function improve as tested by this questionnaire, I'm going to really stick to this medicine to see if it works. It gives, it's, you know, how many times you write a prescription that the patient doesn't understand and never even bothers filling it. This is now engaging them to understand why they're going to do it. And if the patient doesn't improve, then you try a different therapy or you try a different dose of the, diff of the same therapy. So the idea is that you take your patients, they have standard medical therapy, you give them a baseline KCCQ12, then you start some new treatment and you reassess. If they uh, get better, you continue the therapy and the patient understands why they're taking therapy. And if they don't get better, then you go on to the next one or you alter the dose. It's a very simple concept, but the idea of starting to integrate these PROs in clinical practice, I think is very, very important. And it also gives us an opportunity to start to evaluate and improve the quality of care we deliver. And you would say, well, you know, um, patients are busy, the clinic's busy, the patients don't like to do it. There's a group in, in um, uh, Utah that's been really now doing a lot of qualitative work. They've implemented PROs to routine clinical practice, and they just published last year sort of in a, a deep qualitative interview of 24 patients in whom it was used. And 23 of them said that they strongly felt that it helped them think about how they were doing and to communicate better with their providers. And so they thought it was really helpful in doctor-patient communication. 22 of the 24 thought it actually improved their care. And 17 felt that over half, over two thirds, felt that even more attention should be given to their KCCQ scores. But if the doctor didn't discuss their KCCQ scores with them, they were fr frustrated. And so, you know, we as doctors, if we use these tools, have got to start to um, uh, collect them, understand them, which hopefully this presentation helps with, and then actually use them in clinical care. And it also lays the foundation for quality assessment. You know, there was uh, a large US registry that just completed about a year and a half ago of 5,000 patients across 150 centers. And we looked at the proportion of patients in each practice who had very good control of their symptoms, meaning monthly or no symptoms, um, or uh, a very good overall health status, like a case, uh, New York Heart of One, signified by a KCQ score uh, on the overall summary scale greater than 75. And we looked at the variation across practices after adjusting for 28 patient characteristics. And what you see is remarkable here. This is the proportion of patients whose symptom scores were 75 or greater. So some clinics, only 10% of patients had scores of uh, 75 or greater. And others, it was 80%. And after you adjusted for 28 different characteristics, there was on average a 54% greater likelihood that a patient would have minimal symptoms at one random clinic versus another. The variation was just as great with the overall summary score, ranging from no patients having a score greater than 75 to almost 80%, and a median odds ratio of 70% you know, meaning that on average, the same patient showing up at one random clinic versus another would have a 70% greater likelihood of having a KCCQ overall summary score greater than 75 at one of those clinics. So in conclusion, PROs are increasingly important in generating evidence for new heart ther failure therapies. The FDA is starting to support them. But we have to start using this more to improve the way we conduct our clinical trials, enrolling patients, but most importantly, in presenting the results in a way that we can understand them. And finally, I think that the cutting edge, the next phase of PROs is being able to use them in clinical care to enhance and engage patients in care because the patients like them. And I think eventually making them quality metrics so that they're a mandatory component of clinical care. So I really appreciate your time. I'm gonna stop sharing and I'd love to address any questions that you might have. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, John. And that's actually a really master uh, uh, overview, you know, of uh, all the uh, tremendous work in terms of evaluating, you know, quality of life uh, as a component of our care for our patients. And uh, also, you know, all the work that's done in particularly, you know, using some of these tools like HCCQ so that they are actually approved, you know, through FDA as a objective um, uh, endpoint uh, for trials, which is so important, you know, so something that we tend to forget, uh, even though it's really top of mind for the patients, uh, you know, work uh, from uh, Louis Sun here, uh, you know, really indicate that from the patient's point of view, you know, the disability and the quality of life are way, way more important than the mortality, you know, which we tend to really, you know, belabor over these uh, tiny curves. Uh, I'd like now to actually invite uh, Dr. Rob Beanlands to uh, join us uh, as a panelist and uh, Rob uh, uh, is the division chief at uh, uh, here at the, the University of Ottawa Heart Institute uh, for cardiology, but also the lead for education initiatives and uh, really champion these series. And uh, Rob uh, can also um, help to uh, manage the Q&A uh, section as well. Rob, uh, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, John. That was a great, great talk. Um, uh, we have a couple of questions coming in. Peter, did you want to start with uh, uh, your question? Uh, sure. Yeah. So thanks so much, uh, John. You know, there are so obviously, you know, uh, your, your talks stimulate many, many uh, uh, questions, uh, but one which uh, is a kind of a, a practical one, and that is that uh, using the overall summary score versus component score of KCCQ, you know, in terms of uh, uh, interpreting, for example, uh, benefit of uh, therapy. An example, a most recent one is, uh, for example, the EMPER trial, you know, evaluating another uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, you know, very much similar to the DAPA data you mentioned earlier. Uh, whereas looking at the overall score, uh, you know, it wasn't really as impressive, you know, in terms of the uh, average number, you know, so it certainly goes in the right direction, but may not have hit the, for example, the five uh, points threshold. Yet when you actually look at the, the component scores, uh, you know, things like uh, um, symptoms and uh, uh, those aspects is actually quite impressive. And uh, so I think, you know, if, because of, I think the different domains may behave differently depending on the treatment. And uh, so the question is how do you um, uh, use the KCCQ in those type of setting? Do you use both of the average as well as the components, you know, to gain insight, uh, or do you tend to still, you know, use only the overall score? Uh, so for I, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, this is a cardiology grand rounds, and so um, how does a cardiologist use an echo versus uh, a family practitioner? In the family practitioner, the echo is just what's the EF, and is it above or below fifty percent? But for us, we pay all this attention to these nuances about, you know, diastolic function and, you know, E prime and this and that and the other, you know. So as you get more familiar and more training, you get a deeper and deeper appreciation of what it represents. And so to me, the family practitioner view of the echo is most analogous to looking at just the mean difference in the KCQ overall summary score. But as you start to use this in clinic, you'll get a, a much different impression. So for me, I do start with the overall summary score because it gives me the 30,000 foot view of what's happened. But then I actually spend, you know, look at what, what domain improved, you know, a lot. It's interesting. I mean, in the um, uh, STLT2 trials, you know, symptoms are usually the leading yes. indicator that improves. And, um, you know, uh, quality of life and social limitations lag a little bit further behind. Mm -hmm. In the um, uh, uh, Navicaptid trial for, for uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, physical function actually seems to lead, you know, and uh, uh, follow closely by symptoms, you know. And, um, and as a clinician, I think you're going to react differently depending on what scale. So, if you have, let's just say you have a patient with a score of 60 and, um, and their you know, symptoms are 40, their physical limitation is 50 and their quality of life is 80, you're going to say, well, gee, you know, what's limiting their KCCQ score are their symptoms. And so I need more diuresis. I need to 
more afterload reduction of blood pressure control because you're going to think about the symptoms being the barrier. But if the same patient with a score of 60 had a symptom score of 80, a physical score of 80, and a quality of life score of 10, you would say, well, God, their symptoms aren't that bad. Their functions aren't that bad, but their quality is terrible. They must be depressed. You're going to think differently about how you approach the patient given the different profiles. And so we're still early, right? I mean, you know, we're still in, you know, B mode echo here. We're not in, you know, into, you know, maybe early 2D. We're not into, you know, three and four D echo right now. And so, you know, we need more people thinking about it and more people working on it and more experience using it to get a, a better sense. But you know, we just have to start somewhere. We have to have a, a common foundation for starting to learn. All right, so there's a few questions rolling in. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, first from Nicola Masso. Um, uh, so there's a cost implementing these to, into practice and into interfacing with uh, electronic health records and so on. Um, how, how do you tackle that? How have you tackled that with administration or what have you seen in other institutions? Obviously in Kansas City, there's a lot of uh, support for this, but um, how have others tackled this in terms of convincing administration to implement um, uh, these, these questionnaires in, into practice and into workflows? So, so it's, inter it's very interesting and it, it varies a little bit by, um, uh, you know, region and country and, and, and local market, you know, it, but I, I'll give you a very quick anecdote, which is that, uh, you, you know, University of Utah was in a very competitive environment with Intermountain Healthcare. And, and the reason they've been leading in PROs is Vivian Lee, who was leading at that time said, you know, we're going to be able to define and quantify the value of healthcare we provide and use that to negotiate with payers. And the way they did it is they measured PROs. And there are examples of orthopedic institutes that implemented PRO measurement. And then they could go to payers and say, look, you get treated here. Here's the benefit. Can any of my competitors show you that they can improve the quality of life or the function or the pain of their patients like I can? And it gives them a very important competitive advantage. Um, I think that as we move to, in the U.S., to value-based healthcare and at-risk contracting, we're going to, our health systems are going to need to understand the health status of the patients so they can do population health and get the sickest patients treated by the most experienced clinicians to minimize readmissions and costs. And nothing predicts readmissions and death like the KCCQ. It's independent of every other parameter, and it's very inexpensive. The costs, you know, we do license the KCCQ and it's uh, uh, about, so we work with the International Consortium of Health Outcomes Measurement, but in clinical care, it's about um, 50 cents per patient, regardless of the number of times you use it in that patient a year. So if you use it twice a year, it's about a quarter of, uh, per administration. If you use it you know, five times a year, it's about 10 cents a, an administration. I mean, it's not a very expensive you know, thing to do. And we license it because that's how we supported all the translations and all the research we do, because you can't get federal grants to do this kind of research very easily. I mean, now you can, but not back in the day, you couldn't. Um, the impl you know, it is an absolute crime to me that the EMR companies have not built this as a free package as part of what they do. In fact, for the hundreds of millions of dollars you pay for Epic or Cerner, it ought to be free, right? They ought to pay the license fee and they ought to be um, uh, giving it to you. And ultimately hospitals have to demand it and they'll get it because they're only responding to the demands of the hospitals. And if the if Medicare starts mandating it as a PRO, I think all of a sudden the, the EMRs will provide it for free. There are lots of apps and companies out there that collect these, but getting them integrated in the EMR is challenging because the EMRs are financially vested not to allow interoperability. And so you know, ultimately what most practices have done is they get their own IT guys to create their own program to work on implementing it at their own institution. And they can't really lift it and borrow somebody else's because they're all custom made. And, you know, I, I've helped dozens and dozens of people get the scoring right and try and get it to work. And uh, that's what has to happen. You have to work with the hospital. You have to settle them on the vision as the future of healthcare is about being explicit about quantifying the quality. It will help them with 
uh, population health management and ultimately help our doctors provide a better care and improve the satisfaction of our patients. And if that can't convince your hospitals, you should go to a different hospital. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next is from Robert Chen. Um, uh, similar to what I asked you before the talk uh, there, John, uh, are, are patients involved in research design and, uh, prop and the proposal stage? Um, and yes, how, that how, do we, how do we enable that? Better. Yeah, yeah. So that varies a lot by uh, study, uh, you know, the, the specific studies. And, you know, with the PCORI funding it, over a decade ago and uh, uh, the way uh, NIH is evolving in the U.S., most trials are now having patient representatives and engagement. In my experience, when I participated, the thing that patients gravitate to most as being most important is actually the collection of PROs. They are very... Um, they feel it's very, very important in the design of clinical trials. It's what they care about. And they, you know, I, I've been very gratified by how much they've liked a lot of the concepts I shared with you, particularly around translating the results in clinical care, because they have often said, these are the questions we have as patients, and here are the answers we want. And so folks like Bray Patrick Lake and others who've been real champions to the patient voice have been really positive to uh, a lot of these concepts. Um, thanks. Uh, um, next from Andrew Crean, um, a, a good question here. Um, does it work well with patients with HEPPEF, in, in particular people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where mechanisms of dyspnea um, are often different than ischemic or, or um, reduced ejection fraction uh, types of heart failure patients? So it's a great question. And, and it really goes to that slide that I described before about um, where there's the underlying disease process and then it manifests itself as symptoms, function, and quality of life. And the patients only know the latter, not the mechanism of why they feel dyspneic or fatigued or anything like that. And so I think it works very, very well in HEPPEP there, we've seen almost identical prognostic associations between cross-sectional and changes of uh, KCCQ and HEPREP and HEPPEF. Uh, there was a, um, an article looking at that in um, a JAMA Cardiology about two years ago. And, uh, you know, we've seen uh, very comparable validation studies. So I think it works very well. When you get to um, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy or HOCAM, you know, when there are other symptoms that patients have that are important and bother the patients in certain disease states, like it, it, chest pain might be a much more significant issue in the um, uh, HOCAM population than it is in HEFREP or HEFPEP, more standard HEFREP or HEFPEP patients. And you're not capturing that, you might be missing something that's important to patients. And so, but you know, I will tell you in the Explore HCM trial, the improvements on the KCCQ were extraordinary. I mean, they were bigger than any of the SGLT2 uh, uh, ARNI sort of therapies I've ever seen. And so it worked exceedingly well for the symptoms that uh, were overlapped and whether it also underestimated the benefit on chest pain would require getting something like a SAC or, or another chest pain questionnaire to capture a domain that's not captured in the KCCQ. So when you apply these PROs, I think you really want to be sure that, and this is where your patients can be very helpful in informing your thinking about this, that you're capturing all the manifestations of the disease that are important to patients. Um, uh, finally, one uh, very interesting question, uh, whether there's data on whether the KCCQ can differentiate symptoms and, and quality of life uh, changes or limitations uh, from frailty, uh, that is, um, versus uh, cardiac causes, you know, in the way like we try to use uh, cardiopulmonary testing and so on to decide if it's pulmonary versus cardiac versus um, musculoskeletal whatnot. Is, is there any data on being able to differentiate the different causes of changes in quality of life or symptoms? So, uh, so that's a very challenging 
yeah. thing. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Peter, I'd be like a real hardcore scientist, would be disgusted at the lack of controls in our studies for doing this. And so it's very difficult to do. The, the, what I would say is this, that in its design, the KCCQ, like the Seattle Energy Question, were designed to be disease specific, meaning that, you know, for example, on the physical limitation items, there's a final option, limited uh, or did not do the activity for other reasons. So the idea was that if you asked about hurrying, hurrying or jogging to catch a bus and the patient ha was an amputee, you know, had, had a lower leg, uh, leg uh, amputation, you know, they wouldn't do the activity. And they, if you didn't have that option, they would say, well, I'm very limited in, in being able to run or to jog or catch a bus or to climb a flight of stairs but it wouldn't be because of my heart failure, it's because of my amputation. So we designed it to try and focus on the amputation. When you get the more overlapping concepts like frailty and heart failure, I mean, as part of the frailty, cardiac frailty due to the heart failure or not, you're not gonna get this kind of separation that you would like. And, and, and moreover, I think you would really believe that there would be a reason why a more frail person with the same amount of heart failure as a less frail person would have worse symptoms and more physical limitation and poor quality of life. And so sometimes you can't, I would never propose the KCCQ as a diagnostic tool. Right. And I think there are uh, probably threats to its validity and reproducibility and reliability in certain competing conditions and it requires a lot of thoughtfulness and clinical judgment to figure out which is which. Yes, just like we're taking the history in general, like you, exactly. you need to exactly. consider all those points. So. Um, anyways, this has been uh, excellent, really some solid lessons there and uh, definitely um, I think we have to try to get the, um, the patient related outcomes, um, uh, patient relevant outcomes into our uh, clinical practice more and find ways to do it um, within our own institution and, and elsewhere. Um, I'll turn it over to Peter to close out. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks so much uh, again. As I, I, on behalf of the community, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. John Spurtis for an amazing uh, talk. It's a fantastic uh, opening lecture for the series, and really actually, you know, help us understand that the science, you know, behind the quality of life measures uh, that we use as a tool. Uh, that not only in clinical trials, but how to translate into clinical practice. And I think this is really, uh, you know, sort of a beginning of an entire new uh, era, how we can actually think about this. And really a very, very critical component of our patient-centered care. And so this is a, you know, great start for 2021. And uh, so I'd like to thank John again for joining us and look forward to some of the discussions with some of our investigators as well. And uh, so, and to thank everyone for joining us uh, today. Uh, for this uh, 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 opening uh, lecture uh, for the series. And uh, so just uh, for our next uh, grand round, it will take place on February 3rd uh, uh, on Wednesday, and it will feature Professor uh, Ehud Rani, uh, who's a professor of surgery uh, at uh, uh, Sackler Faculty of Medicine, Tel Aviv University in Israel, who will discuss on the uh, state of art uh, surgical and percutaneous mitral valve therapies uh, for patients uh, with uh, mitral valve disease. So thank you very much. And uh, th also thank Kelsey for managing the uh, logistics. And uh, thank you again for joining us uh, for this uh, uh, very exciting session. Yes, and, and for the upcoming meetings with others. I appreciate that very much, John, thanks. Yeah, thanks uh, Rob for the leadership, yeah. Thanks very much.